time I was given uh, about um, a section of Natural Bulava. The, the phrase I want to uh, speak to you about uh, will certainly be familiar to you. It's probably one of the most famous um, uh, quotes from Natural Bulava. And, and the reason I'm quoting it is not to just rehash things that you already know or have already heard about it, but to hopefully kind of um, cast some new light on it that maybe, maybe you haven't um, considered before. The phrase is from the letter of Ma'al al Santa Malik al Ashtab, um, it's letter number 53 from Najib Allah, and he says, Wa ash al qalbaka al rahmata al ra'iya, wal mahabbata lahum, wal lutfa bihim, wala takunanna alayhim sabuan dariyan tartanimu ukudahum, fa innahum sinfan, imma akun laka fil deen, wa imma nadirun laka fil khal. The translation goes like this Infuse, he's, uh, Imam Ali speaking to Malik al Ashtar as um, as he's sending him off to Egypt. Infuse your heart with mercy, love, and kindness for your subjects. Do not be a voracious predator stalking them, seeking an opportunity to devour them. For they are in one of two categories. They are either your brothers in Islam or God's creatures like you. <clears throat> so first of all, why, why did I choose this particular phrase if it's something that's already so commonly um, sp spoken about and so commonly repeated? Um, the reason is that this particular phrase, um, I think, has been um, uh, not, not only quoted probably most often from Najib Bulava, but also probably butchered most often from, uh, as one of the quotes from Najib Bulava. I mean, the meaning that people usually take away from this, kind of the conclusion they jump to after reading this um, particular phrase from, from Najib Bulava, um, is, is, is um, in, in, in my opinion, and I'm going to present my reasons for it, is in, in, incorrect. Generally, uh, when, when you hear this, this, this phrase that people are in two categories, they're either your, your um, brother in faith or um, they're, they're creatures, God's creatures like you, um, the next conclusion or the next kind of the message um, that comes out is, you know, all people are equal, human rights for all, and everyone's the same before God, and these sorts of things. And, and that's not at all what the phrase is saying. Right, I want to um, share a couple of things. There, there's, some, there's certain contextual clues within the, within the, 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 the sentence itself that Imam Ali is, is writing that show that this, that's not his conclusion, that's not his, his, his message. Um, and then um, another reason why this can't be his message is because it goes against so many principles that we have in Islam in, in, in general. Right, so let me explain what, what I'm talking about. First of all, let's look at the, um, the actual words of what he's saying. He says, infuse your heart with mercy, love, and kindness for your subjects. Right, the pronouns here, right, first of all, he, he literally um, mentions abra'iyya, which is your, your people, your subjects that you're going to rule over in Egypt. And then all the pronouns that he refers to after that, they all refer back to those subjects of his. Right? So when he says, they are either your brothers in faith or, or uh, God's creatures like you, the they refers back to your subjects. Right? So who are these subjects that he's ruling over? The subjects uh, Malik is going to be ruling over is, is Egypt, right? the territory of Egypt at, at that time. Right? Whatever the borders uh, were, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we, we know what the actual borders of Egypt were, but the, consti the constituents of Egypt we, we, we can know uh, because it, it fits with, with Islamic principles as a, as a whole. In an Islamic state, um, you have um, uh, basically three categories of people who, who live as citizens within an Islamic state. One category is Muslims, right? And Muslims um, will um, uh, take on certain rights and and and. and, and, and Islamic law, when it deals with Muslims, it, it treats all Muslims equally. Islamic law treats all Muslims equally, whether it's Sunni or Shia, these sorts of things. Um, the other category, two categories of people, one will be Dhimmis, Ahlul Dhimma, and these are um, Christians or Jews who have agreed to live in the Islamic State under certain conditions. And in exchange for those conditions, they um, enjoy certain protection of the law as citizens of, of the Islamic State. And so in particular, they have to pay, for instance, they have to pay a jizya. And the jizya is a particular tax. It's like a, almost like a poll tax that they have to pay um, in exchange for military service. They're not allowed to fight in the, in the Muslim armies, um, uh, but they, 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 they do have to pay um, for, the, for the right not to fight um, in, in the Muslim armies, but pay, pay for protection by the Muslim armies. So they have to pay a, a tax. And, um, and there are other, other things they have to agree to abide by Islamic law, at least in public, on, on the surface. They can't drink in public. Um, if they want to you know, drink privately, that's, that's, that's their own, own business. Um, but, but they wouldn't be able to do it in public. They couldn't practice their religion out in public, um, but they, they're certainly allowed to practice it in private. 
So there's certain rules that they have to abide by, and as long as they abide by those, then they can enjoy certain um, uh, you know, liberties and certain you know, rights within the Islamic government. The third category are people known as Mu'ahad. And mu the Mu'ahad people are, um, they are other categories, not people of the books. They're not Christians and Jews. Like, so Mushrikeen, for instance. But they have to, in order to be able to live in an Islamic government, they have to um, uh, basically um, uh, agree um, to, to live under certain um, uh, restraints, uh, constraints. Right? So um, uh, the only way a non, a, a non Muslim and a non Christian, a non Jew <coughs> could live in an Islamic government is through the system of, of um, kind of signing this contract with the government saying that I agree to abide by certain laws. Um, and uh, as long as I do that, then, then I, I we're at peace with you. So basically, you're signing a treaty with the government. Um, so that, that's his constituency. That, those are his subjects. When Imam Ali is talking about your subjects, he's not talking about all humanity is in two categories. He's talking about your particular subjects, which excludes people who are fighting against Muslims, for instance, which excludes mushrikeen who don't agree to, to, to sign this sort of contract with the Islamic government. Right? There are many categories that are, that are excluded from this phrase. It's not a universal statement of human rights. He's talking specifically about your, your subjects in Egypt are in two categories. So you can't use this phrase then and extend it to all humanity. Say all humanity, therefore, is in two categories, and they're either your brothers of faith or your or, or their creatures like, like like you, and therefore they have you know certain uh, certain rights. Right? So that's that's the, the first argument that that like, jumping from this phrase to a, a universal human rights is is a stretch, because that's not exactly what uh, the Imam is, is talking about. The second thing we understand from the Imam's phrase, he says, they are in one of two categories. They are either your brothers in Islam or God's creatures like you. So very clearly he's dividing the subjects of, of Egypt into two categories. So not only is he not talking about all humanity, but now he's not even saying that all of Egypt and all the people of Egypt are the same. They all have human rights, they all have whatever, you know, certain inalienable rights. That's also not what the Imam is saying. Explicitly, he's saying there are two categories. There are two different categories of people. Right? So again, to jump to that conclusion that you know, the Imam is saying all human beings are the same, is, it's, not, it's not at all what the Imam is saying. He's saying that even, even your subjects um, are in two categories. You have Muslims on the one hand, and then you have the other two categories, the Dhimmis and the Mu'ahad, uh, people who are, who are living there in the, uh, you know, under the protection of the government, and those, those are, are separate. Not only is he separating the, um, them into two categories, who, who are each going to have different rights and, and uh, different kind of uh, levels of protection under the law, he's also setting up a hierarchy. Because he says, "Imma akhun laka fi din wa imma nazirun laka fi al Right. So the kind of more exclusive group is the Muslims, because the Muslims are not only Muslims, or yeah, they're not only Muslims, but they're also God's creatures like you. The other group, they're not Muslims, but at least they're God's creatures like you. Right? So by, by the way he's, he's divided it, he's saying that they're Muslims, and then there are other people who are at least God's creatures like you, if not, if not Muslim. Right? So he sets up a clear hierarchy that there are two, two different categories, not only two different categories, but the Muslims have a certain uh, status and, and, and a certain um, position in, in Islamic government, and then the other people who are allowed to live there, the Dhimmis and the Mu'ahad people, um, have a second kind of, they're second class citizens basically, they have a second um, kind of tier within the Islamic government. Right. So this is a, again far, far cry from universal human rights and these sorts of things. My, I'm getting to like, the point I want to get to, I mean, before you kind of get kind of too, too frazzled in case it's something new, uh, is, is that we need to make sure that when we read the text of the, of the Imams or the Quran, that we're trying to understand what they're saying and we're not imposing our own idea. Um, on, on them and saying, you know, I have this idea that sounds really good. Uh, let me let me let me uh, fiddle with the words of the Imam to try to make him say what I'm saying. Right? We want him to be the leader. Let him be the Imam and we be the Ma'mum. Let's not try to make ourselves the Imam and, and make the Imam come along with us and make him the Ma'mum. Wow. All right. So um, so until now, what I've, sh I've showed you shown you is the the phrase of the Imam. Um, the words themselves don't lead to this conclusion that all, all human beings are the same, that all, universal human rights, and able to rights, and these sorts of things. Now let's look kind of more, more generally at Islamic teachings as a whole and see that um, that idea of universal inalienable rights for all human beings doesn't even jive with Islamic teachings as a whole. First of all, 
um, the whole concept of inalienable rights. We have this. Uh, let me quote this phrase from the, the, the Declaration of Independence. So Thomas Jefferson he, he wrote this, this into our, our um, uh, um, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their Creator with certain un, he says unalienable rights, which is supposed to be inalienable, inalienable rights. But there's a discussion why he chose unalienable instead of inalienable. Um, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right, so he's asserting that there are certain unalienable or inalienable rights. Inalienable means they can't be made alien to a human being. They can't be separated from the human being. They're intrinsic rights. Just because you're human, you have certain rights that go with you, and so no one can take those away from you. Right, that concept in itself is, um, uh, is, is contrary to how, how the Islamic worldview portrays rights of, of human beings. Our, our rights as human beings are not intrinsic, are not kind of um, something that we, we, uh, we are owed by God or owed by anyone. We, we're not born with rights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the, he's the creator of all. And our, uh, you know, whatever, whatever rights he has deemed um, you know, uh, uh, good for us, he's given to us. And so our rights are not because we're human beings. Our rights are because he's decided to give us certain rights. And whatever rights he's chosen to give us, we, we, we have those rights because he's given them to us, not because I'm a human being. And if he doesn't give me this right, then, then I can, I can you know, somehow go back to Allah and say, you know, you, you, you've wronged me. Right? So even the right to life, I don't have the right, a right to life. I, Allah owes me life. If he doesn't give me life, then, 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 then what? It doesn't owe me life. It's a gift he's given me. He's chosen to give me life. It's a gift he's given to me. It's a blessing he's given to me, and I can I can I can use it in a way that's pleasing to him or or displeasing to him. My my property. I don't have a right to property. It's it's a, it's a gift he's given to me, and he hasn't given to some people, and he can take it and, and, and give it as he pleases. It's his to his to do with as he wishes. Right? So we don't have inalienable rights as as in the Muslim worldview. Whatever rights we have, they have to be given to us, and we can only know what those rights are. By, by looking at the, at the sources, at the Qur'an and the Sunnah, to see what rights has Allah decided to give um, either all human beings or certain categories of human beings based on their roles in society and these sorts of things. What I think has happened, or wh why we kind of jumped to this conclusion that all that there are inalienable rights, is um, because I think we're, we're, first of all, we're influenced by our surroundings. And we have the Declaration of Independence, and this is uh, that, the, that, that idea, this paragraph I just read to you about inalienable rights has really kind of um, uh, permeated our own understanding of who we are. So instead of getting our teachings from the, the sources of Islamic um, uh, guidance, we've tended to sometimes get our, our information from uh, by osmosis from, from the environment around us. And when everyone's talking about inal inalienable rights, and it sounds like a good idea, you say, oh, that must be it sounds, it sounds good, and Thomas Jefferson saying it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's self-evident that we have these rights, so it must be self-evident, so it must be true, um, when that's not, that's not, not the case. And we should um, re revisit these concepts and see what does Islam say about them, um, and not just kind of take you know, Thomas Jefferson's word for it, or, or our surroundings' word for, for, for that. But what has happened then is that we've, I think we've mixed up a couple of different concepts, and I want to try to separate those, those concepts um, uh, uh, fr from one another. One is that we, the thing that we do have that's inalienable or, or kind of intrinsic, inborn within us, is we have, all human beings, just because we're human, human beings, we have the potential to be good, the potential to be guided, to, 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 to choose guidance, to you know, make ourselves pleasing to Allah. So we have, everyone has that potential. The, the prophets and the, and the Yazids and the pharaohs, Right, everyone has the same that same potential within them to to accept guidance and then um, and then and travel a path of guidance towards Allah. So that's that's a, you can say that's a kind of a, a universal thing that all human beings have simply because they are human beings and Allah has created within every human being uh, a, a faculty that we call the fitra, right, this kind of innate nature that we have that pulls us back towards God, that helps us to kind of you know um, draws us back towards the, the source from which we came, the Creator who's, who's created us. So that's something that's universal. Another concept that we should, uh, that's, that's, well, that's one of the four concepts. The second concept that we should kind of separate and not, not mix up in the whole, in, the, in, in this mix, is um, the concept of, of, of rights. Right, so it's a separate thing. One, one thing is innately human beings are endowed with the faculty of fitra, which is this God-seeking 
God knowing nature that he's, he's given us. That's one, one issue. The second issue is, is um, what rights do we have? We know now that you know, rights are not inalienable. They're not endowed kind of just because I, I'm a human being. I, God owes me something. That's not the case. But what rights has God given me? And what rights has he given other categories of, of, of human beings um, in general or within Islamic government? These rights are in, in, in two categories. There are some rights that we have um, uh, just because of our circumstances. Right? It's not a choice uh, that I've, I've, I've done something and therefore I get rights, but sometimes some of the rights that are given to us is simply because of who we are or where, where we stand in, in particular relationships and particular parts of society. So for instance, um, a, a wife, right, simply because she's a wife, because she's engaged in a, in a, in a, 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 a lawful um, a marriage with a, a man, a wife, in, insofar as she's a wife, um, is uh, given rights to be provided for. Right, so it's a, a right that's been given to her, not because of some, she hasn't chosen the rights, but simply because she's married, she, she has that position as, as a wife, she's been given certain rights. And one of those rights, for instance, is that she has the right to be provided for by her husband. Okay. But then there's certain rights that come with choices. Either we get certain rights or we lose certain rights because of certain choices that we make. The same wife who is given by Islamic law rights to be, to be provided for, she can relinquish that right or revoke that right by failing in her obligations to her husband. Right, so one of the things that, we, that, that we're told in Islamic law is that um, a, a wife, for instance, uh, she's, she's, she deserves certain, um, uh, certain, certain rights, like I mentioned, to be provided for, but if then she doesn't fulfill her obligations towards her husband, then then he no longer, um, um, one of the things he can use to, to, to kind of uh, set the balance equal is to stop providing her with her needs um, until she, she, she does her, kind of holds up her end of the bargain. Right, so there, there's a, she has a right because she's a wife, but then she can choose to do something, um, uh, kind of a crime or, or sin, which will, which will um, kind of uh, sever those rights from her until she gets back in line. And, and similar things happen for the man, and there's so many other different um, examples uh, for that. So in the same, in the same way, um, um, those three categories I mentioned of the citizens of an Islamic state, the Muslims, the Dhimmis, and the, and the Mu'ahads, um, all three of those uh, categories, because of who they are, because of their, their, their agreements with the Islamic government that they will abide by the law, uh, they get certain rights as, as citizens of the Islamic state. Right? But to say that all, like, all human beings have equal rights, that, that's a false statement we've seen. Um, because for instance, somebody who's fighting against the Muslims does not have those rights as, as a citizen of the Muslim state, of course. Right? That, that goes to universal. I mean, someone who's fighting against the United States does not have the same rights as a citizen of the United States in the eyes of the, of the, of the um, American government. Right? Um, and even, even you know, there are differences between, for instance, somebody who's, who's uh, born um, as, as a U.S. citizen versus a naturalized U.S. US citizen. Right? For instance, the, the famous one is that a naturalized citizen can't, be, can't, can't become president. And maybe there are other differences as well. Um, so similarly, in the Islamic State, there are differences based on different categories. The, um, there are some rights, like for instance, um, the right to due process, right, to a fair trial, is there for all citizens of a Muslim state, whether they're a Muslim or Christian Jew or, or a Mu'aha, even a Mushrik who's agreed to, who's kind of made a treaty with the government, he also enjoys that right to, to be treated fairly in, in the court of law. So that's that's that, you say that's a, a universal right again within the context of, context of an Islamic government. It's a right that's given to all citizens. Let me share a couple of examples to, to wake you up. I know I just have a couple more minutes to, to, to share with you. But so there's there's some examples of this from Imam Ali's time. Um, there's one where he um, he had a piece of armor that was that was stolen, and he, he spots this armor in the possession of of a, of a dhimmi, um, a, 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 one of the 